What's up? It's George the Fragrance Craze. Do you know how much the fragrance industry has changed in only the past 20 years? Let me give you an example. How many fragrances were released in the year 1999? Well, according to the website parfumo.com, that number was 514 releases. That's a pretty good amount, pretty decent. That's a lot of smells, new smells coming into the world. Now let's look at 2019. How many were released then? 4,445. That is nearly a 10 time increase of fragrance release in only 20 years. Is it any wonder why fragrance bloggers, fragrance YouTubers, just fragrance influencers across the internet are being pounded and sent uh, requests to review lots and lots and lots of different free bottles and free products and this and that and the other? It's because they just want anybody, and I mean anybody, to just give those companies a voice. It does, in fact, become incredibly difficult as a fragrance reviewer. I mean, just this year in 2020, that number has expanded again, going over 1,200 fragrance releases, and we're only just entering May. As fragrance business and fragrance money has caught on, and the fact that you can now distribute fragrances incredibly easily via the internet, this number is probably only going to increase and increase and increase. Like every sort of consumer product is increasing. Television shows, films, and because of that, fragrances that are really, really good, and fragrances that are absolutely fantastic, can sometimes get left to the wayside. There is one fragrance in particular that I've been testing for the past month, and I genuinely feel that it's one of the greatest designer fragrance releases, maybe of the last decade. I just didn't get a chance to properly wear it. I didn't get a chance to properly test it because it was just one of many. It was a fragrance that I do remember liking, I do remember wearing it and enjoying it, but it had a problem against it. What was that fragrance? Prada Luna Rossa Carbon. The problem? It was touted and had the reputation of being a Dior Sauvage clone. And the problem there is quite simple. For people like me who isn't really the biggest fan of Dior Sauvage, I'm not going to investigate this because I don't like Dior Sauvage. And people who do enjoy and are really big fans of Dior Sauvage, well, they've already got Dior Sauvage. You see, the reason why clones do really, really well is because they're usually cheaper alternatives to a fragrance, whereas this was around about the same price as Christine Dior Sauvage, so what's the point? Now, to be fair to it, it was actually quite a hit when it came out, but it's a phenomenon that I call a disposable hit. The same ilk as something like a disposable razor. You use it once, it does very well, but then it just sort of peters out and then thrown in the garbage. When it came out, it was great, people did enjoy it, but then the comparisons came, and oh, it's so like your Sauvage, there's no point, it doesn't matter, and then yes, of course, it just sort of fell into disarray and not many people talk about it. However, on rediscovering this, yes, of course, it, it is basically, uh, it's very, very influenced by Dior Sauvage, there's no question, but I much prefer this, much, much prefer this, and I'm going to explain why. George, have you just clickbaited me into a review of Prada Luna Rossa Carbon? Yes, I have. So let's start with the presentation. Presentation is absolutely gorgeous. I really like the bottle. I think that it's a lot more sleeker. It has that sort of darker rubbery edge around it. I like the embossed carbon on it. I think that it's a really, really cool looking bottle and really, really snazzy. And the fact that it's got the, the darker navy blue element with the red and the white, it just looks really cool. Obviously Prada Luna Rossa is of course the, about the Luna Rossa challenge, it's about boats and nautica, nautical life and all that kind of stuff. So the presentation really really works along with that, especially with the navy blue rubber around it. I think it's a gorgeous bottle, it's been looking really really nice in my collection, very very happy to have it, really happy to have it actually, and in fact a few people on live streams and on videos have even commented when I'm holding it up and they said, man that is a really nice looking bottle. When you're getting compliments about a bottle on the internet, uh, that's a 5 out of 5 presentation straight away. 
Then we get to the scent. So here it is. I'm not a big fan of Dior Sauvage. I know that that's a wildly, wildly unpopular thing to say. I know that people absolutely adore Dior Sauvage and I'm certainly not taking away anything about its popularity. It has been an incredibly enduring and popular fragrance. It is something that sort of revitalized the designer market. So I'm not gonna take anything away from it in that. But for my personal opinion, I found it way too harsh. I found the metallic element really, really quite cheap. I found it synthetic. I didn't enjoy it. I found it very spiky and I found it, yeah, quite nauseating. I found it quite synthetic. I didn't think that it smelled high quality. I didn't enjoy it. And I felt as though there was sort of a wrestling match between the metallic sheet metal elements and the more fruity aquatic blue elements. And I just felt as though there was sort of a fight going on on my skin and I really didn't enjoy wearing it. I've smelt it on other people. I still don't really like it. I just don't get it. It's not for me. There's obviously just something that just really, really doesn't work for me. It hasn't worked, it didn't work for me then. It doesn't work for me now. But as self-help teacher Tony Robbins once said, sometimes you're just a millimeter off. This is when he was being taught how to play golf and he did a swing and uh, he got it completely wrong. And the golf tutor just looked at him and said, literally you're one millimeter off. That always stuck with me. And I feel as though that's the same kind of thing with this and Luna Rossa Carbon. Daniela Andrea, who is the in-house perfumier for Prada. She also did some work with Chanel. I think that, you know, her formative years as a perfumier um, were in Chanel and she learned a lot of the ropes with Chanel and you can totally tell that as well. So then she was taken over to Prada and Prada were a very, very old school Italian style perfumery. They want everything to smell clean. Everything's got to be clean. Everything's got to smell as though you've either like just rinsed yourself in soap or you've taken a bubble bath. And that's just kind of how it works. It's a very, very um, respected and celebrated discipline in Italy to be able to do that. So that's what her style is. She's come out with incredible, incredible fragrances. All arguably have a similar tone. You know, that's the only criticism that goes to her, towards her, her work. You know, if one guy was wearing Idris Cidre, another guy was wearing Prada Amber Palm, and the gentleman was wearing Prada Lom, are they really that different? <laughs> you know, they, it, there's definitely an incredibly similar feel. So then, basically, I don't know this, but it does feel as though some, you know, the, the project manager just went up to her and said, we want to do Sauvage, we want to do something that's very similar to Sauvage, and that was the end of that. In training, like I said, when we were in store, we got told that, oh, this is like an, in, it's influenced by Daniela's uh, father who worked in a factory and she wanted to recreate the smells. I don't know if that's a load of bollocks or not, to be honest, but like I said in the clone, industry clone video, this could go towards explaining why the metal, it doesn't feel as though it's actually sort of fighting with the blue elements. I feel as though there's sort of more a hierarchy that's going on. The metal is here, then you have Daniela's cleanliness that she's really known for, which is in those other Prada fragrances that I just talked about, and then you have the blue fruitiness the blue aquatic marine kind of smell that all of the blue fragrances are using. So with that sort of hierarchical structure, there's a real incredible balance that's really smooth. So you've, but also at the same time, it's like you've got metal on the top and you've also got metal on the bottom as well. So that is something that is very, very overt and that is consistent within the fragrance but you've also got this really, really strong element of Daniela's discipline with making those really, really soapy, bubble bath-esque kind of scents. So what you get is something that's incredibly clean, incredibly sexy, but it has a definitive blue edge to it. And to be completely honest, it works so well and it is all so harmoniously beautiful it's almost kind of perfect. It's almost, in fact, you could say, I, you know, I've been doing this for quite a few years, I think I'm allowed to say this, this is a perfect fragrance, guys. And that's quite a big thing to say, you know, it's not something that I say all the time, it's not something that um, is easy to say because everything usually has issues and everything usually has errors and you have to critique and you have to look at the, you know, th my, this might not work and whatever, but this is completely for what it is, a really, really perfect, picture-perfect fragrance. 
and it's absolutely outstanding. I really, really have enjoyed wearing it. And for somebody who is not even a Savage fan to like myself, to just sort of fix all of the errors and fix all of the issues that I've had and then give it this sort of like really new car like shine um, with the cleanliness in the fragrance, it's absolutely outstanding. It's a fragrance that I would totally recommend if you're wanting a casual signature scent and it's very versatile. I've been wearing it uh, in the higher heat, but when I started wearing it a month ago, it was actually a lot cooler. It was fine then. Now it's a lot hotter. It's absolutely great now. I haven't found a threshold yet of when I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's too hot to wear this. I shouldn't wear this today. That's one hell of a balancing act, but Daniela is one hell of a disciplined perfumier. It's a fantastic fragrance. I've adored wearing it. It's a five out of five. Performance, this is overall a four out of five. It's, it's like, it's really just a solid, solid designer uh, performance. It's not insane beast mode, it's not like going over the top, but it's exactly what you'd want. It comes and it goes really, really well. I'd say actually it can push for me, especially with the longevity, somewhere towards 10 hours. That's actually moving more to like a strong five out of five, but it doesn't go the full route and it doesn't sort of like take it too far. So it's a perfectly knit and fit, snug as a bug in a rug, four out of five overall um, performance, but I think it could vary. I think that for some people it, you might get less performance. For other people, this I could imagine if you've got the right skin chemistry and skin combination with this scent, it could just explode. So definitely test it yourself. Overall, this is a fragrance that got lost in the shuffle and it had that reputation of just being a Sauvage clone, but this is really something different and you can get something so much more out of this even if you're like me and you did not enjoy Sauvage initially. But here I am making a stand and saying that Prada Lunarossa Carbon, in my opinion, is pretty much a perfect designer fragrance. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much. I'm the Fragrance Press. If you enjoyed, please subscribe. There's fragrance content coming out very regularly from this channel. Thank you so much. I'll see you again. Bye.